Hey everybody, it's Dr. Eric Ball Cabbage. We're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers podcast. And today we have another guest. His name is Ashok Gupta. He's an internationally renowned speaker, filmmaker, and health practitioner. He's dedicated his life to supporting uh, and helping people with chronic illness, chronic health conditions. And so we're going to talk about what uh, he's found with his with his research and and what he utilizes in his uh, work in his programming to help people overcome different types of chronic illness. So without any further ado, Ashok, welcome to the Thyroid Answers podcast. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Eric. So pleased awesome. to be here. So probably one of the best places and the place I always like to start is to find out who is Ashok Gupta and why should our listeners be paying attention? Mm -hmm. Well, good question. Now, I think like many of us on this journey, we've started with our own challenges. And certainly for myself, you know, I remember that day. So I was, you know, in my early 20s, I was studying it un as an undergrad at Cambridge. And I just suddenly had this brick wall in front of me where I caught some kind of virus. And we hear this story very often with people with these types of conditions. Got some kind of virus and I recovered from the virus. But for some reason, my body just went downhill, right? I suddenly started finding I was exhausted. I had to crawl to the bathroom. I pick up pick up a textbook and I couldn't read the words on the page, and I would go from doctor to doctor. They'd say, "We don't know what's wrong with you. We don't know what it's called. We don't know what's causing it, and you might have this for the rest of your life. It could be this thing called chronic fatigue or chronic fatigue syndrome, but we don't know." And that was like a death sentence to me as a young man, thinking, "I can't even function. What is going on here?" And that started my lifelong quest to try and understand these types of chronic diseases, chronic illnesses. And I remember in my worst moments, almost being suicidal and thinking, if I can just get myself well, I will spend and dedicate the rest of my life to supporting others through these types of conditions, because there's so much untold suffering that is going on. And then I researched brain neurology. I started understanding what I thought caused these types of conditions, got myself 100% better using some ad hoc brain retraining and then set up a clinic to support others and publish various medical papers uh, on the subject and then trained in various complementary and alternative treatments. And since then, we've obviously published a, an online program, an app, and then various randomized controlled trials. Uh, so it's been a journey for me, from my own experience to healing and recovering, and then finally looking to support others. Right, so what do you think is driving? What did you find through your through your own condition and through your your training and, and research is driving many of these chronic health conditions and people struggling with, you know, fibromyalgia. It could be anything, like any type of chronic health issues. What's the, what do you look at as maybe one of the contributing factors to these people who go from doctor, allopathic physician to allopathic physician, and when that doesn't work, they go to functional or integrated practitioners. Some people do fantastic when they switch from allopathic medicine to functional medicine, maybe do more trying to find the root cause, which is the term we use all the time in functional medicine. You got root cause, root cause. But what are the, is there, are you finding there's specific root cause issues in people who struggle with chronic illness or is it different based on the individual? We see it as a root cause. And we see the descriptions of these different illnesses, fibromyalgia, pain syndromes, even thyroid issues, as a description of a cluster of symptoms or processes, whereas we believe the underlying cause of this is in the brain. And if I may, I'd love to share the kind of hypothesis of what we believe causes these conditions. I think that will mm -hmm. then be a foundation for the rest of our kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. So we start with the biggest principle of all, why are we here? Mm -hmm. So let's start with the basics of kind of evolutionary biology. So we can spend an hour talking about the kind of philosophical perspectives, but let's take the scientific perspective. We're here because this brain, this body, this nervous system has been trained over millions of years of evolution to adapt to our environment, survive, procreate, and pass on our genes to the next generation. And many of us think that that adaptive process has occurred just, you know, within human beings, but actually those adaptive processes started even with plant life. Like we share, and I found this fascinating, we share 40% of the same DNA as a banana, which is just incredible if you think about it. So all those millions of years of evolution have all been about survival and surviving and adapting in our current environments. But what's changed? 
we are not living according to our genetic inheritance anymore. So we now have gone from a pretty, you know, pretty much a hunter gatherer or agrarian kind of lifestyle to suddenly in the last couple of hundred years, living indoors, in boxes, sedentary lifestyle. And in the last 20, 30 years, lots of toxins in our diet, lots of pollution around us, high levels of stress. And I could go on and on and on with that, the physical, emotional stresses, which have all then plunged all this stress into our buckets, our resilience, our ability to handle all of the stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when the water pours over the edge, then we get illness, we get dysfunction in the body, a lack of homeostasis. And so if that's our starting point, that survival is the number one priority. When we get some kind of insult on the body, so there are three, three or four main ones. So the main one would be a virus or bacterial infection, right? Another one would be some kind of to toxic exposure, so mold or, you know, or obviously even Lyme as part of a bacterial infection. Or it could be some other kind of physical stress or some kind of pain that we're hit by. Those are the kind of three or four main things that we tend to get hit. Now, normally, our bodies have this adaptive response. So it says, OK, this is the threat. Let me manage the threat. So that's either switching on the immune system or whatever it may be. And once the threat has been dissipated, right, we switch back to normal, switch in the off position. Mm -hmm. But because of our modern environment, our systems are in threat activation mode almost continually in the background, this kind of low-grade background inflammation, low-grade protective responses, which in and of itself can cause thyroid issues and various stuff. But when a, a bigger insult comes along, I believe that our system doesn't fully switch off. Yeah, and we've talked about earlier on, you talked about the cell danger response and various things. Mm -hmm. Our system doesn't fully switch back to this, we are safe position, but stays in the position that maybe we are still under threat. Because our systems want to err on the side of caution. They want to make sure, let's just keep our protective responses on just in case those threats are still visible. Yeah. And uh, Eric, I don't know, are you a Game of Thrones fan by any chance? I did watch Game of Thrones. Okay, there you go. Well, if if people listening aren't, uh, we can take the analogy of, let's say, a fairy tale. Let's say. So imagine you are King Eric. You are king of your castle and your kingdom. And you have an army, which is your nervous system. And you have your navy, which is your immune system. And it fights off various invading armies that try and conquer your kingdom. Now, along comes a threat. So let's take the COVID infection, because that's something that we all kind of have recently uh, been acquainted with. So the COVID infection comes over the hill. And the army and navy are galvanized to fight off this infection, right? So they fight off the infection and we go back to normal. But imagine there's a drought in the kingdom. There's a bit of weakness in, this, in the kingdom, perhaps based upon, as we said, this background low-grade inflammation or we're fighting something, some constant threat off like pollution or toxins. So now our army and navy are in a drought and therefore they're not as powerful, not as effective at fighting off the invading army. So now they fight off the invading army valiantly, but they've been left traumatized, just like soldiers in war become traumatized. And they come to you as the King Eric and they say, King Eric, you might get used to this, by the way. King Eric, it's got a nice ring to it. I, I make my kids call me King Eric, so it's fine. Fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully your partner as well. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then um, so then they come to you as the, the generals of the army and navy and say, mm -hmm. right, we believe that we have fought off the threat, but we can't be totally sure. We would need all the resources of the kingdom. We need the, the metal, the wood, the corn. Everything needs to be channeled because we need to protect the kingdom. Because if the kingdom falls, we no longer exist. Yes, it's number one. Survival is priority. So all the resources go to the army and navy. Now, they keep fighting off this potential army. But now, even a little child walking over the hill, they fire off their weapons of war because they're not sure what is going on. Now what happens is you're in this dysregulated state where your defense systems have been galvanized and continue to fight. But some of those arrows start landing back in the kingdom accidentally. And that means that when we start getting some autoimmune effects where the immune system now starts attacking healthy cells, maybe in a passive way or in a more aggressive way. Then we also find that spies can come in. So normally there are resources that go to the Secret Service who make sure there's no opportunistic infections and bacteria in the kingdom, those spies. But suddenly mm -hmm. they start flourishing as well. So we now have a system that is stuck in over-defense mode, which is not designed to do, which then causes autoimmune and inflammatory effects in the body itself, in the kingdom itself, but also allows opportunistic infections. And the thyroid problems, in my mind, are just a downstream effect 
of this overstimulation of our sympathetic, even parasympathetic aspects, the freeze response, as well as uh, inflammatory immuno responses, which then cause this massive dysregulation across our whole body from our glands, our organs or hormones, cell danger response, mitochondria, everything is in a dysfunctional state. And we might think, well, what's wrong here? What's going wrong? No, the body isn't doing anything wrong. It is performing what it thinks is the best strategy for survival. It's just that it's maladaptive to what has happened. So that, in a nutshell, is how we look at it. And for the listeners, this is this explanation is not much different from what I talk about on a regular basis, is that what we often see, at least at the beginning, when somebody has an illness, is, it, is an adaptive response to the threat. And is when we have low stress, low low levels of stress on the system, we make a sufficient energy to do everything we need to do. We call that homeostasis. When there's an excessive amount of stress on the situation, the body shifts from its primary role inside the cell as manufacturing, making hormones and healthy skin and digestive enzymes and all this great stuff that makes us feel good. It does it, those cells downregulate the manufacturing process and then shift towards more cell defense. That's not in my opinion, sounds like it's your opinion. That's not broken physiology. That's adaptive, right? At least at the onset. And the longer we're in that adaptive physiology, we start to pattern our physiology, which is what you're saying. Like, hey, this is what I need to do on a regular basis. Continue to do that. Meanwhile, we're down-regulating this manufacturing process. We can't produce the energy. We can't, we're not producing the amino acids and peptides and all these building blocks. And we're wondering why we don't feel good. And we try and fix the broken foot. Let's give more B6. Let's give more B12. Let's give more of these things. Let's give more thyroid hormone. We just need to fix it or optimize is what you'll hear the term. And then we're frustrated why it's not working. And it's not that we're assuming the body's broken, right? And that or it, it, it's not really broken. It's adapting to the biggest common theme. And that's the big challenge, right? And we assume that everybody's in homeostasis when most of the people who have chronic health issues, thyroid issues, whatever, it's an adaptive response, at least at the onset. And then we're also surprised when we start to have, I've got gut issues and thyroid issues and adrenal issues, and we start to treat all these individual situations like they're, that's the thing, that's the thing. And what I talk about, Ashok, in my book, I, because people love to hang their name on it. What, what do I have, right? What's the name of my disorder? Because we've got them so trained in allopathic medicine that we treat the disorder. What's the name of it? I'll give you a treatment for that disorder, not the person, the disorder. But I call it when my patients started asking me, well, what is it, right? I said, you have a multi-system adaptive disorder. That's what you have. Mm -hmm. And what we, the way to fix it is not to manipulate all the different systems. I'll give adrenal support. I'll give this support. I'll give that support. I'll give this support. It's to really do what functional, what I think functional medicine should be, which is to say, what is creating the excessive stress load and how do I reduce it or eliminate it to a point where the cell danger response goes away and we can start into a cell healing response. And I like the analogy used, the analogy I use for my clients is sometimes that, hey, imagine somebody attacked you walking down the street or attacked your child, right? Would you go, if you, if they arrested that person, would you go back to normal moral or would you be in fear almost every time you walk down a dark street? Like, could somebody jump out? That's kind of what we're talking about, right? We'd still hold on to that protective response. I think the people that respond really, that recover are the people that can go, okay, I'm aware here in between my six inches of my ears that the threat is gone. It's time to go back. The people that struggle with chronic illness don't recover that piece of it. They're still, they're conscious or subconscious. They're working from a perspective of constant danger. And there's no way we're going to fix your GI tract long-term. We can manage it, band-aid it with supplements and, and medications, but we're not helping you recover health because your, your body is still in that adaptive role. Is that fair to say? Oh, yes. I mean, Eric, it sounds like we're absolutely on the, the same page in terms of the initiation process the perpetu and then the perpetuation process is something that i'll come on to as well but certainly from an initiation perspective it sounds like we're absolutely on the same page it's a maladaptive response based upon not living according to our genetic inheritance essentially is right. the way i kind of uh, describe it 
And, you know, when we look at downstream and upstream and original causes, I literally use the idea of downstream in the sense that imagine you're standing on a bridge, right? And you're looking over the, into the river and there's people who are drowning. So you think, okay, let me jump in the river. Let me save this person. Oh, there's another person over there drowning, right? Jump in the river, save that person. Jump in the river, save that person. And you set up this rescue center, which is modern medicine, which is right. Every time we see someone in the river, we're going to rescue them. And aren't we brilliant and amazing? But nobody's asking the question, who's throwing these people into right. the river in the first place? So right. we've literally got to go upstream. And the ex next exciting piece here, Eric, is that traditional medicine is focused on what is measurable. So medicine focuses on what well, I can measure the limbs and I can measure hormones, I can measure enzymes, I can measure this and that. But the brain for many decades was a black box. We don't really know what's going on in the brain. We can see a few brain scans and this gets lit up and this gets lit up, but we don't really know truly what is happening. And recently, in the last 10, 20 years, we've now been able to kind of really peer into what the brain is, is doing much at a much deeper level. And we're realizing that actually a lot of these conditions are hardware problems, are not hardware problems, they're software problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, As you say, the kind of system of uh, messaging and information is where the core issue is, a functional issue versus a physical issue. And we've now, from our research, gone even deeper to find specifically the parts of the brain that may be responsible for these types of chronic illnesses and chronic diseases, uh, which is also you know, really, really exciting. And we're doing a lot of kind of more research into this area as well. And so that, I think, is now this, this next era of medicine. I, you know, I truly believe in five to 10 years time, if someone comes with one of these conditions, I hope that actually brain retraining is what is then prescribed for them because there's enough of an evidence base behind it to support that type of approach. And of course, that might be in complement to the downstream approach as well, which is looking at supplements and medications that can support the body in this, in this state that it's in. But primarily, in addition, we would also look at the, the brain retraining. And I think that's the exciting era for medicine over the next 10 years. So if somebody's got, we talk about this, hey, an, an appropriate, right, adaptive response to a threat, right? But let's say now that acute, like everybody has a, a stress response. I got a virus, I get sick, I'm, all the things, all these systems kind of downregulate, we upregulate the inflammatory system. That's a cell danger response. But a lot of us in seven to 10 days after that virus, it goes away, right? What's different for the person doesn't recover? What's going on differently? What have you found is going on differently for that person than the person who recovers easily? Right. So this is the exciting neurology. We believe there is something fundamentally different in the brains of those people who go on to have these maladaptive responses. And we believe this actually starts in the womb. Right. So let me let me let me uh, characterize this this hypothesis. Here. It is an hypothesis. We all have two brain structures, I believe, are involved. The first is the amygdala, which are two almond shaped structures that sit behind the eyes. And they are our threat response. So they essentially decide what is threatening in our environment. And traditionally, they were associated with PTSD and anxiety and stress. But of course, the brain doesn't differentiate between oh, this is an emotional threat. This is how I'm going to deal with this. This is a biological threat. This is how I'm going to deal with this. The brain's structures simply say, what is threat to my survival at whatever level? Let me create the appropriate response. So now we're realizing the amygdala is involved in immunological and pain responses. So that's one part of our brain that I believe is different in these types of patients. The second is the insular part of the brain. Now, the insular doesn't sit in the limbic system. It sits between the cortex and the limbic system. And its responsibility, or one of its responsibilities, is to take in all incoming data from the body, including from the vagus nerve, assess that information in terms of uh, our nervous system, our immune system, our threats, and then create the appropriate biological mechanisms that ensure uh, homeostasis and survival. Right. So that's another role that the, I mean, it has many different roles, but that's one of them, is to take in this incoming data. And we believe that we often see that people who get these types of conditions, and it's not saying it's in the mind, so let's be very clear about that. They often have experienced or have more likely to have experienced adverse childhood experiences. Right? And those adverse childhood experiences create the factory setting of our amygdala and also potentially our insular as well. So we know that the amygdala is impacted by how stressed our mother was whilst we were while she was pregnant with us. Also, the birth experience. Then, of course, the first five, 10 to 10 years of life. 
depending on how much nurture we received, our amygdala will determine the level of threats in our environment, both at an emotional level, but also at a physiological level. And that's the key extra piece of neurology. Then as when we become an adult, what then happens is those patients or those, sorry, those people who have a more sensitized amygdala and also potentially the insular part of the brain, when they have a virus or a bacterial infection, their systems are more primed for defensive behaviors or hyper-defensive behaviors, because that's been primed at an emotional level, but also at a physiological level. So then those types of patients, the brain errs on the side of caution more that if this threat is still here, I need to keep upregulating my defense responses. And I say defense at a, a kind of you know, aggregate level. Whereas somebody who doesn't go on to having these chronic diseases, perhaps doesn't have a brain that responds in that similar way or that type of way. And the reason we also see more women having this type of response compared to men is because I believe that people, a, a woman's insular and amygdala and their immune system as a whole functions differently and is at a different sensitized level compared to a man as well. And that's why we see the differences in the percentage of patients who get these types of conditions. Yeah. So I think there's definitely a difference between men and women and, and young and especially as in the neural developmental process, right? So I, we definitely could see some changes there. But I think what you're talking to, to some degree is, we're talking about, and I talk about this, it's really maybe about the load, right? And so if early on, we have a lot of, and for the listeners, we get like, we get programmed, like we learn the alphabet, like we, we get programmed. So the early stressors in life kind of set our early, and you can correct me if you want, um, our early programming of how we adapt, how we how we function. I think that's what you were kind of talking to towards. But I always look at things as like a load, like how much load can I take before I, I trigger the stress response and before I start to really alter physiology. And for some people, we get extreme amounts of stress and we challenge and the system starts to break down, but then we can recover we, and we come back under threshold and now we go back to normal function. But if somebody already has a bigger cumulative load and they exceed that capacity, then, and that extreme thing goes away, because of all the load they're, they've accumulated, they, it makes it more difficult them to get back after, get below that threshold and to get that back down to somewhere near a baseline. No, but a lot of people have such a load on their physiology that they're almost always fluttering in and around that threshold level of constant danger response. So I think those, I think it's very similar, I think, into what you're saying, right? So, and at some point we, we train this kind of primitive area of the brain, but this is the normal operating mode. And for a lot of people, they don't assume there's any Tuesday. This is not this is how it always is, right? And they don't know what good could be or what better is because they're always operating from this threat response. Does that make sense? It does. And I will say this two. Let's tease out two components here. One, absolutely, I agree with you. If the system is already always under threat, it's filling the bucket quite easily. Right. So when we say filling the bucket, our, our resilience, our ability to handle the stress of our environment, mental, physical, emotional. So stuff keeps coming in and it's coming in at a faster rate because we feel like we're under threat a lot of the time. So that is one component. The additional component, which is a really fascinating neurology, is that when we have this type of brain, or this type of insular and amygdala, it's more prone to conditioning effects. So mm -hmm. new learning effects, classical conditioning, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. We know that the brains of those people are more likely to learn new stuff, mm -hmm. which makes them more prone to having these diseases. So it's not just the, the load capacity, but it's the conditioning, uh, pr the pr being how prone they are to the conditioning effects. And there's one line in a book by one of my favorite professors, Professor Joseph Ledoux, who's almost the kind of godfather, godfather, the kind of forefather of uh, kind of conditioning effects in the amygdala specifically. He did a lot of research, a lot of animal research. And he says that when the amygdala is on high alert, 
it is prone to learning new conditioning effects to otherwise neutral stimuli. Mm -hmm. And this gives us a clue, and I believe this is the root cause of a lot of these diseases, to the vicious cycle that starts occurring. The brain is in this hypersensitive mode. It is stimulating the immune system with the inflammatory markers, and it's also stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. So we know patients often describe feeling wired but tired. You know, they kind of feel mm -hmm. like there's something going on. But sometimes they have the freeze response as well with aspects of the parasympathetic nervous system being stimulated unnecessarily at the same time. Now, that's because of the conditioning effects and we have then this lack of homeostasis. But there's an extra piece which is so fascinating that I believe then goes on to cause long COVID, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, which is these symptoms in the body are normally neutral. The brain just thinks, hey, I have symptoms in the body, no big deal. But this new conditioning occurs in the amygdala and insula where it starts perceiving these symptoms as potentially representative of ongoing threat. Danger, yeah. So those symptoms then loop back to a hypervigilant, hypersensitive brain. The brain says, I knew we were in danger. Look at what I can feel in the body. Right, we need to trigger hypersensitive these defense responses. Triggers the defensive responses, causing symptoms in the body, looping back to a hypersensitive brain. Then we get caught in a secondary cycle, which is the vicious cycle, which then means we're stuck in a process of ongoing illness because the output and the input of the system have got linked. And we know from physics, right, if you get a wave function, it has to be because the output and the input systems have got linked in some way. So the stimulus was a neutral stimulus, symptoms in my body. The meaning or the interpretation was that doesn't mean anything. The response was nothing. Now the stimulus is symptoms in my body. The meaning is this is dangerous. It's characteristics of me having this lifelong incurable disease that I can do nothing about. The response is we're in danger, trigger the immune system and nervous system. That then loops back to becoming a stimulus, and we now have an integrated stimulus meaning response loop. Yeah. So for the for the listeners, essentially what we're saying here is you get you're essentially training the body to be really good at responding excessively to things, right? And so we're training the body to be really perceptive to anything that could generate pain, and we get really good at those. We get really good at, we get stronger at having this protective response. It becomes more of a built-in system that we become really efficient in. The problem is, as we become really efficient at firing off, oftentimes it's happening inappropriately, right? Like, I just stepped on a, a rock. That shouldn't initiate a, a systemic inflammatory pain response when I just step on a rock, right? But it, that's the key that happens. And I... I this is maybe a little bit technical, but when we're talking, talk, we're talking here a lot about the nervous system. And when we think about a nerve, a nerve is like in a very negative state before it fires off. But it, and it takes a lot of stimuli to get that nerve from its negative state to this positive state that it fires off. But the longer you have this neural input coming in, those nerves get closer and closer to threshold all the time. And so instead of before, maybe it took you a stimuli of 100 to get to threshold where you would fire off your nervous system. Now you're already at 98, 99%. And so any little bit of stimuli and you're firing off a nervous system response to something that should have never created that. Just think about your, your spouse when you come in and you put a glass on the kitchen table and they just got done cleaning up and now they're like, what are you doing? Why are you putting it? It's an, you're like, wait a second, I just put a glass on the table. But there's their, their tolerance at that point, something is creating that uh, chronic stimuli, emotional stimuli that's causing them to fire off inappropriately because nobody should be upset about a glass being put on a table. Um, and that's kind of what we're talking about. Small amounts of stimuli, which sometimes would have been considered normal, appropriate. Now we start to have what we would normally consider an excessive or an inappropriate response. Is that fair to say? Definitely, Eric. And I, I would say that um, this is that trigger happy response. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so many patients notice that they become a bit more sensitive to stressful situations or a lot more sensitive to stressful situations once they are in this dysregulated state. Mm -hmm. And not only that, we can see how that also then 
is appropriate to the sensitivity reactions or sensitivity illnesses we treat. So mold illness. Someone has an exposure to mold, 100% mold creates 100% reaction. But once the system is conditioned to do that, it errs on the side of caution. So now 5% or 1% of the original mold exposure can cause a 100% response in the nervous system and the inflammatory response that occurs. So once again, um, this is where the system is now trained as a protective response, as the right evolutionary biology thing, biological thing to do, which is to efficiently respond to threats in our environment. The problem is it's too efficient. It's learned it too well. And so I often say to my patients, your evolutionary biology is too good. That's what's going on here. You know, a reframe there. It's too good. It's doing it too well. And now we want to ratchet it back to a normalized level of threat response. Okay. So there's two questions here that somebody who's listening to this may be thinking. One is, so Ashok, you're telling me that what's wrong is is my fault, right? I'm making this, it's, you're telling me I'm, I'm making this happening to myself, right? So that's what somebody's thinking, like, hey, it's all in your head. This isn't a real thing. This is you making this occur. What, what would your response be to somebody who's thinking that? It's not in your head, but it's in your brain. And differentiating that those two aspects of conscious awareness and rationale versus something that's unconscious, that's beyond our ability to currently influence. This has happened accidentally without a patient's knowing. So we know that the insular and amygdala parts of our brain, they are unconscious. They're in the limbic or they're just sitting between the limbic and the cortex. They're not our fault. We don't directly control them. But what we do in our program is we train a patient to be able to regain control over these unconscious processes that previously they didn't have any control over. So it is not a patient's fault. And that's where often people have this misnomer that because we are saying that it's cause in the brain, somehow we're saying it's conscious or someone has deliberately done it in some way. No, it's very unconscious. The, the brain is simply an electrical kind of hub of information and, and learnt responses of which our consciousness is a very small part. Our consciousness is maybe five or ten percent of what the brain is actually doing and processing, and all this. You know, our heart's beating. Our, you know, our, our thyroid, when it works well, is all being functioning. What's controlling all of this? I believe it is centrally in the brain, and therefore a lot of that is unconscious, and therefore it's not someone's fault. It's in the brain, not in the mind. Right, and I guess a simple, maybe a simple way for somebody to understand how powerful the brain is and how it can be trained for good or for bad is your brain knows you have a foot, right? It's been trained to know that there's a foot. But if you lose that limb, that brain still thinks, at least for a period of time, that you have a foot. And so you really have to work on training that part of the brain over time that that foot is not there. So we can, the brain has kind of, a, it's its own, it's its own, um, computer software that's going on up there. And it's ba what happens up there oftentimes is based on the, many times, just based on the input that comes in determines the output that comes out. And if we build it, that certain pathway that you're talking about, we make that pathway really good at, hey, everything is pain coming in, then the perception coming out is we've got to adapt to the stimuli. So mm -hmm. the second question might be, okay, now what do I do about it? If this is potentially a problem for me, I'm a person who's got some chronic health issues. How do I change that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's this? How do we go about doing? It? And there's lots of techniques out there. Uh, Bruce Lipton was a is a guy I talked uh, with early on in my career. I think I was still in school when I met Bruce Lipton for the first time. Um, Joe Dispenza is out there showing how the mind and what goes on in the mind can change our blood chemistry, our stool tests, all these things in a very short period of time. There's other people and there's other techniques, but in general, most people want to know if it's subconscious, it's in my mind, how do I go about changing that? I mean, do I really have control to change it? Mm. Yeah. So this gets to the crux of it. So. First of all, we don't even say it's in the, the subconscious mind. We say it's in the unconscious brain. So we, it's parts of the brain that we have no 
a conscious awareness of, but we can influence. Yeah. And you talked about this kind of, you know, this electrical system, or I talked about the electrical system. Let's imagine a car, right? So what generally happens with our car before, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, the tire would go wrong or the door wouldn't open and we go and get it fixed at a mechanical level. But now when you go to the garage with your car, it a lot of the time it's an electrical system that's the problem and they plug their computer in and they reset the electrical system and lo and behold, everything starts working again, right? And in a similar way, a lot of these modern diseases are software problems, not hardware problems. Now, it's not the physical hardware, it's how the hardware is organized and the information sent to it in terms of how it should organize itself. And that's good news because we have more influence over that than something that's physical that we can't actually fix. And so coming back to our analogy of the Game of Thrones or the fairy tale, those generals are coming to the weekly meeting with King Eric and saying, hey, we're still under threat, we believe. We need to keep initiating these defensive responses. Brain retraining is when King Eric says, hey, generals, you've done a fantastic job. Well done. You've defended the kingdom. We're still here. But you can stand down now because we are safe. We are no longer in threat. And I can assure you of that. And the first time you say that, those generals aren't going to believe you because they've been conditioned and trained and traumatized over years to believe we're still under threat. And when they see a child coming over the hill on a donkey, they're like, that's a threat. We need to fire off our arrows and whatever. So the first step is, the core step is training them that we are safe. Yeah. And this is something which is very different to cognitive approaches. So some people say, oh, isn't what you're doing like just cognitive? I say it's very different to cognitive. Um, and so we're training the brain. Let's take the analogy of driving a car. Like when you first learn to drive a car, you, if you were taking a cognitive behavioral approach, you'd sit there on your first lesson and think, right, if I really want to drive this car, I can do this. I have positive thoughts. I'm going to let go of any negativity. I'm going to believe that I can drive this car. But that isn't going to help you drive the car. What's going to help you drive the car is to train your physiology to do it. So you take your first driving lesson, you move the steering wheel, you press the accelerator, the brake, the, uh, the gear, stick, gear shift. To the Americans, you don't have your gear shift, but you shift all this stuff and you train your nervous system. So eventually after 10 or 15 lessons, you can listen to the radio, make a phone call, eat a sandwich. And all of those systems are automated in your unconscious brain. You've learned it at a neuroplasticity level. Because the brain is neuroplastic and flexible, it can learn new stuff and can do it automatically, just like learning a musical instrument. What we do here is we train our nervous system to come out of this defensive response. And you might say, well, how, how on earth can we have control over our immune system? How on earth can we have control over this nervous system when it is defending us? Um, I, I'll give you an example here. So let's imagine I took a slice of lemon, a really, really tangy lemon, and I placed it on your tongue. Mm, it's a very tangy lemon. Mm, and you bite into the lemon. <laughs> Oh, gosh, it's really sour. It gets your mouth to salivate, all these salivating, all this tangy sensation in your mouth. Mm, now you're salivating. Now, most people, when they go through that experience, they get saliva in their mouth. Now, isn't that incredible? We know consciously that that lemon doesn't exist. And yet, me just describing that creates an unconscious physiological response in your body that you don't you didn't even know you didn't have control over right we literally can't control our saliva just through that type of suggestion so in a similar way we're able to actually target these defensive responses and inform our brain that we are safe yeah? now the first and the three r's of our of the, the kind of process so um the first r is relaxing the nervous system so that's where we incorporate breathing techniques meditation techniques calming techniques, you know, anything that helps calm the nervous system at an overall level. Yeah. And that's nothing new or different. That's what a lot of different treatments and programs encourage. Yeah. And the way to look at this is imagine a field and our stimulus interpretation response that we're in danger is like a river flowing through the field. Now we need to divert the river because if the, all the thought energy keeps going along this left-hand path, all the energy of the brain keeps going on the left-hand path that we're, danger, we're in danger, it's dug a channel, it's fixed, it's locked. But we need to divert the river that's rewiring the brain to a different pathway. But that ground is solid, froze, frozen solid. We can't move it. So then the relaxation of the brain 
enables us to till the soil, to make the soil loose. And we know from studies that when we meditate, when we breathe, when we calm the brain down, it's more neuroplastic and flexible. So that's the mm -hmm. first step is to prepare the ground. The second step of brain retraining is to divert the water and dig a new channel so that when it rains, not all the water goes down the left-hand channel. Some of the water now goes down the right-hand channel. But we know what happens when you dig a channel. Guess what? You come back a year later and that channel has gone, right? They dig up ancient riverbeds from a million years ago. And even though there's been no river flowing for a million years, they can still see the indentation in the ground. So we have to dig this right-hand path again and again and again and again until the old path on the left-hand path is filled up with soil and grass is growing. And now the river is rerouted along a different channel. And for the brain retraining, we have a unique set of various tools and techniques that we've developed over the last 20 years that enable someone to have control over that. One of the main techniques is something called the seven step process. These are seven steps that someone physically moves through that train the brain that we are no longer in danger and that we are safe and that these symptoms that we are experiencing are not of effective significance. So are not something that we need to hyper defend against and worry about. So it's a seven step process that people go through. And then we also have something called somatic retraining, which is essentially training the brain that symptoms in the body whilst focusing on, on them are, do not represent danger. And thirdly, we have another technique called the accelerator technique, which is a rapid fire technique to train the brain that we are safe. And there's a number of other supporting techniques as well. All of these techniques, we don't feel they come under cognitive approaches. They're more like uh, when someone has a stroke and they lose control of an arm or a limb. They have to go through rehabilitation to train their brain to regain control, literally creating new neuronal connections to the arm. Uh, and that's what we're doing here is repeatedly creating these what we call safety neurons. And in the work of Professor Joseph Ledoux with, on, on animals, what he found was that when animals were able to overcome their PTSD responses, there were actually new neurons created from the prefrontal cortex down to the amygdala that sent a safety signal as soon as the amygdala was about to respond to a previous threat. So they're actually literally called safety neurons. Yeah. So that's how we, we kind of do that. And the third R, which is so, I suppose, unique, we don't really see this in medicine, is re-engaging with joy. When patients are in chronic disease states, they're often depressed, they're anxious, and this feeds the fire of defensive responses. And so this third R, re-engaging with joy, is all about helping a patient in a longer term control their stress responses so they don't get relapses and instead understand what helps keep a settled nervous system and part of that is being able to re-engage with the joys of life that perhaps previously they have ignored because they've just been focused on healing and getting well and that's for us important we don't want just people to get well we want them to stay well so we look at the underlying causes of their stresses what may have precipitated the illness in the first place some of the emotional challenges they're perhaps not dealing with and go on to then leading a life which is more reflective, less reactive. And this is also an important part of longer term healing. And many people are surprised when they come into our program, they think it's just a program about brain retraining, heal, get on with life. And they realize, oh wow, I've healed, but now this is a whole personal development program about how I stay well and how I stay happy. Because staying well also means uh, the science of happiness as well. All right. So I've got a bunch of questions after coming through through that. Right. So how are you determining that what's driving somebody's chronic illness is brain based only and not by some chronic infection or something else that's going on? How are you making the decision or are you saying? that really doesn't matter i can override the programming with a technique to do it just like somebody who's let's say uh, an ultra runner who even though they're going through the pain cave they can kind of keep their will their body to continue to go and come out the other side at mile 80 i can't i can barely run my feet are killing me everything hurts i'm throwing up 
And somewhere around mile 95, they're like, all right, here we go. I'm good. I had to go through that pain cave and come out the other end. It's a real threat going on that whole time. But with the right mindset, because really what makes the difference between somebody who can do it and who can't do it, it's what's going on in the brain and in the mind. And part of the training is training that amygdala, right? Down training it that even though I'm in pain, this is not a problem. This is just, this is not a thing to be concerned about. This is not a reason to shut down my physiology. This is a, I, this is tolerable. This is good. Isn't that, that essentially what we're doing with it in, in ultra endurance sports? Something like that is retraining the amygdala to, to have, um, to not be threatened, right? Is that, like, I mean, look at uh, Alex Hobel, who's free climbing, Aces of rocks with no, which I, you know, most of us would say is ridiculous. There's no way you would climb the face of Al Capitan without a rope, right? Because everything can go wrong. And here's a dude who, his amygdala is getting no danger signals, potentially, it seems like, right? So right, exactly. I, I guess it's too many questions at one time, but mm -hmm. is how do you determine if somebody has a real threat or not? And then I guess, the, and then the, the immediate piece to that is, does it matter? Right. So first of all, anyone who comes on to this type of brain retraining program, we always say to them, get everything checked out by mainstream medicine first. Go along all the avenues, because absolutely, there could be something that isn't specifically a functional issue that could be causing um, you know, a lot of the symptoms. So absolutely, people have to come to us when they've exhausted all other avenues. They've been down the mainstream medical route and they've discounted all the other possibilities that could be there. Secondly, coming back to this important question, it's a both and approach. So we don't say to patients, right, stop all your medications, stop all the other stuff you're seeing with your IFM doctor, only do our approach. It's a complementary approach. But more importantly, when our system is in a dysregulated state, of course there will be downstream physiological effects that are measurable that IFM and mainstream medicine will see as root causes but they're just mm -hmm. downstream effects. And I'll give you a classic example. We know that in chronic fatigue patients, <clears throat> there are opportunistic viruses and infections in their blood work, high viral titers, uh, HRV, all kinds of things, because their immune system is now dysregulated. So it hasn't got the, 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 the strength to fight off these opportunistic infections, which is what we see in the analogy of the kingdom. So there are now mm -hmm. spies in the kingdom that we can't get rid of because the secret service hasn't got enough resources. And but we also see that in patients with autism. So patients with autism, we know that their amygdalas are hyper aroused and they also have opportunistic infections. Mm -hmm. But there are two. So you can see two very, very distinct and different diseases. But at the, the, the thing that's common, we believe, is this overstimulation of the nervous system. And therefore, when we heal this, our detoxification systems now become more powerful. So we can detoxify the things that we're trying to detoxify externally and artificially, but with limited results, because nothing can detoxify our bodies better than our own detoxification systems. Right? I agree with that. Secondly, yeah. opportunistic infections. We know from psychoneuroimmunology that obviously the more stressed we are, the less effective our immune system. Once we stick, get that right, opportunistic infections can also reduce because our system now becomes this powerful force to enable ourselves to eliminate that. Thyroid yeah. issues, so glands where hormones are now out of whack. They also, I mean, we have so many patients that come back to us and say, it's really weird. I've gone back to my doctor after a couple of months and they've done the tests and they don't understand the test because a lot of these things have now equalized or they've massively got better, but I haven't taken any medications and they're just completely foxed by it. Or I'm coming off all my supplements and it makes no difference. Right? Mm -hmm. Because we've now got the system back to its regulated state. And, you know, I find it so funny. You know, my, my clients, when they first come to me, they're like, Oh, Ashok, no, no, I can only eat these seven foods and I've got to have my chia seeds because if I don't, I am not going to be well, right? This is what I've been told, right? Mm -hmm. And we, and, and I think, okay, that's fine. You know, stick to the same thing, but let's do the brain retraining. And once you're more confident, you can come back onto all of these different foods. And naturally they come back on, you know, going back to eating everything normal. But then I'll meet somebody who's the same age, had the same background. They eat badly. They don't sleep. They drink alcohol, you know, excessive alcohol. They have a really bad lifestyle. But they're fine. Right? Yeah. They've got loads of energy in the system. Don't we all know those annoying people in our lives? And we think, gosh, you know what? I stick to this healthy diet. I try and do all of this stuff. 
but somehow they just seem to be happier and joyful and more energy than even I do. And it's so, you know, you're like, what is it? Right. But I think and it's the key component, right? Those people ha have a state of happiness, right? They have a state of carefree. They're not in that hypervigilant state. And I think there's a couple key pieces here, like to the clients who are listening to this, if you've been, there's, I don't think you have to and wait to work on brain retraining. I think that should be an early part of what's going on. However, how do you know? And I would say, you're saying, hey, you got to check everything else out, you know, make sure there's no path word pathology. But if you're the person with chronic gut issues, if you're the person with chronic, everything bugs you, every, every, um, you're super sensitive to all kinds of supplements, right? You've been mm -hmm. to your fourth uh, SIBO protocol, right? To mm -hmm. me, it, if you, if you've, if you got, uh, if you've treated your gut 16 times and you still have the same issues, it's not a gut issue. Exactly. Brain is disrupted because of something else, and this is where the the mo the brain piece comes in. We I call it like emotional brain fitness. What's like a, what's going on up there? Maybe better mm -hmm. to say brain than psychological or emotional because because exactly. we're talking about uh, like really a, a software issue. Um, but if you're this is where people struggle. They keep trying to fix the same thing over and over again with just different with, with different antimicrobials. I've got to, there's some way I'm going to kill this thing. And my, my point to a lot of people is if you keep having recurring affections in your gut, it's because the terrain is appropriate. The body is allowing, you already have an innate immune response. You already have digestive enzymes. You already have pancreatic enzymes. You already have these things. There's a reason something is creating a, uh, a, a signal to the systems and the tissues that this digestive thing, we're not worried about it. Right? We've got a bigger issue and challenge. So if you're the person who's struggling and you've done things multiple times, I think this brain piece is the piece that really is probably the priority at that point. Was it always the priority? I don't know. Was it part of the priority? Maybe it was part of the load, but now because you've been in that chronic illness for so long, you programmed your brain to be really good at creating this adaptive response. And you're trying to adapt the, the change the, adapt, the response to the adaptation. And really what we need to get back to is how do I change the output to all these systems to say, hey, how do I relax? Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head there, which is we are so obsessed with the downstream effects Right. And we're, we're, we're kind of it's like moving deck chairs on the Titanic. I don't know if that's a phrase that. Mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we're moving deck chairs on the Titanic. Thing, well, I just need to change this over there. and I move this over there and perhaps we'll stop the, the ship from sinking. But we've actually got to re, you know, refloat the ship if you take the analogy too far. But it's, uh, basically, ultimately, we are going to be keeping fidgeting with this, changing this, ad adapting this. And the clue to this is we notice a lot of patients and IFM patients and naturopath patients, they tell us all the time, these practitioners, they say, we do some great protocols and we improve outcomes, right? We do well. But then a stress comes into that person's life or they move house or something happens and wham, all of the symptoms come back, sometimes even worse than before. And we're scratching our heads thinking, well, what do we do now? Okay, well, perhaps we need to do a different protocol. So we start doing this over there and shifting this over here and shifting over that. And then they kind of improve and they get better. And wham, something else comes into life. Everything comes back. And all that's happening is it's an ongoing process of making these minor adjustments, but not getting to the root cause. And I have a lot of sympathy with practitioners because I think they really are wanting to do the best for their clients. They really are doing amazing work. But it's so frustrating when you get these chronic patients in because nothing seems to really get them into the long term health groove that they that they want. And that's where now a lot of IFM doctors recommend our program at the starting point. So like Dr. Neil Nathan, a world's expert in, in mold and Lyme, he now trains his practitioner to say, Gupta program or limbic retraining. This needs to happen for most of our patients at the beginning of the cycle, because once we get them settled and we improve, then they're more open to the binders and the. Uh, supplements that we give you know? and this is where even in the ifm world and the naturopaths and nutritionists all doing amazing work the reductionist philosophies that came from medicine 
are now coming into this arena as well, where we do a whole battery of tests. We see that this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And we are trying to correct at that micro level, but it creates more fear in the patient and it then doesn't once again address the root cause. Yet there are lots of other great practitioners, and I admire all of them, who are realizing, okay, we need to do um, some of this other work as well, whether it's brain retraining or we've got to look at some of the emotional aspects uh, as well mm -hmm. to really get long-term uh, benefits. So this is where, so for me, excitement is always where we're down here and there's a huge leap that is potentially mm -hmm. possible right now. We are seeing patients healing from these chronic conditions they've had for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, within weeks and months and long-term benefits. And we're doing obviously randomized control trials right now. We've published some of them. And I see us refining our treatment to the point at which we really can deal with a lot of these different diseases. And for me, that's, yeah, it's exciting. And I, and I do think, and I had this, it's funny because I had this discussion three times yesterday that mm. when we see people, especially in the functional medicine space, I think in the, they're, they're, they're so focused on trying to fix this. I can't eat that. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do that. That this fear of food, this fear that there might be mold in that house, there a fear of all of these things that might get them continues to support these defensive limbic pathways, right? That that whole fear that I can't, I can't eat that. That's going to, that's, oh, oh my gosh, that'll, that'll, that'll kill me. I can't do that. I, I can't go anywhere. Right. So it's it, at some point, the thinking process and the fear process around things creates their issue, right? Don't drop it. Don't drop it. Don't drop it. They're going to drop it. Right. But Hey, I can't eat. I can't eat. I can't eat. Of course you can't. Cause you've just, you reinforce the fact that you can't eat that without a response. If I eat that, I'm going to have a response. And now you're training your brain that that's the appropriate thing to do. Right. And so exactly. yeah. And the, the reason I say that yeah. is, yeah, because I had a patient who's like, I can't eat this. I can't eat that. And they got frustrated. They said, you know what? And we had had a couple discussions about this whole brain related teeth, but they weren't really open to it. And they said, you know what? I never eat out. I never eat. I only eat the limited amount of foods. I was so frustrated the other day. I went out and I just I ate a salad at a, a restaurant. I didn't care what was on. I had the little raisins or whatever and put all this stuff on. And I said, now, how'd you do? He's like, I didn't have any gut issues. I had no problems. I was like, why do you think that was? Mm. She's like, I don't know. Maybe I was just more relaxed. I'm like, mm. right? Mm. Like mm. your fear that your food is going to kill you, that's going to harm you is create is potentially creating a cascade of immune inflammatory gut responses because you're, mm -hmm. you're potentially telling the body that's how it, that's how we need to work. Is that, yeah. is that, would you agree yeah. with that? I would. And I would say a lot of these processes are also unconscious. So we're not aware that we're doing it. So I don't want to, I want to make sure the patients don't feel like they are blamed for it or responsible for it. But it's once that conditioning has occurred, it can be reinforced or it can be changed right. afterwards. I think that's the key thing. And yes, it, you know, we see this all the time where, uh, patients have come to us where they've been on food exclusion diets and then they they thought, well, maybe I'm feeling ill because of that food, right? Let me eliminate that food. Well, that's helped a bit. Oh, maybe it's also because of that food. So they get down to three or four foods, but all that's happening is it's a massive nocebo effect that's going on there. And actually, um, it, those foods were never the root cause, but the brain has now become trained that that's the food, that's the cause, that's the cause. And right. then the brain becomes even more afraid of eating those other foods because it believes that that is then going to cause uh, the symptoms. And um, we, so uh, as part of our program, we also retrain food sensitivity. So within, uh, you know, it can take weeks or months, it depends on how intensive people are with the training, but eventually they can go back to eating most foods. Now we don't say go and eat, you know, loads of rubbish, go and eat loads of fried foods, keep a healthy diet. But at the same time, you can eat the foods which are normal for most people, you know, in the population. It's just training the nervous system not to respond. And, you know, I do feel that, you know, we all, I mean, you can take twins, for instance, right? So you can take twins, they've got exactly the same genetic makeup, and you can see radical differences 
uh, where one of those people then goes on to having chronic disease. Now, you could say, well, their gut microbiome has changed, and that's why they are different to their biological twin. But ultimately, what is the difference between those two people is the programming, the software. The software starts to differentiate or changing between those two twins once they start living apart. And it is that software which is a unique thing that we can target and train. That's the, the difference between all of us as human beings is, this, is the software, not so much the hardware. I think there was a, I think it was the Maxwell Maltz had psycho cybernetics. Are you familiar with that? Yes, psycho cybernetics. Yes. Yeah. So is that part of kind of the, when you're talking about, we need to put, I think one of the second R was retraining and putting, putting different input in. Is, are you using techniques like that to help calm the brain and say, hey, we're not in danger? Like, where, how do you, what does that step look like? Sure. So if you say to your brain, we're safe, this is not, in this is not a danger. There are more projections from our unconscious limbic system to the prefrontal cortex than there are the other way around, which is why our brains are primed for fear and defense, right? Why is it we sit there having negative thoughts rather than positive thoughts if we're gonna leave our brains to their default? Because at a survival level, fear and anxiety and threat analysis is more likely to ensure survival than being happy, which is why uh, we're more prone to kind of analytical thinking or negative thinking. And we have to kind of you know, really be aware of that. So in a similar way, we have to train the brain that we aren't in danger and one of the responses that also come from psychocybernetics, but it doesn't, it doesn't come from psychocybernetics, but it's mentioned there, is the idea of visualization. But we call it more imagination. Yeah, Just like we did with the lemon. When I imagine placing a fake lemon on your mouth, even though you know it's fake, it still creates a physiological response. Now, taking that to the nth level, if we can persuade the brain at using imagination that actually we aren't in danger and it can downgrade those responses, the brain will respond accordingly because it can't tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined. Yeah. Right. So, so then to do that is, is what you're doing in your program is this equipment based is like, if somebody needs to do like, there's all kinds of tech, there's devices out, there's neurofeedback to help retrain the brain there's there's things like muse apollo neuro brain tap like there's all these devices i think that are trying to do it there's other techniques edmr and map method and a whole bunch of things how is what your and i know you can't really answer all of like compared to all of them but where how does what you're doing differ from some of those things so there are definitely lots of medical devices out there a lot of them aimed at uh, triggering for instance the power the the vagus nerve right so triggering the vagus nerve so we get more of a relaxation response um, in the body. And that's for us just the first R, which is the relaxation of the nervous system. And for some people, that's enough to actually start healing them in many different ways. But ours is very different because we believe that when there is a reliance on something external to create a response, it never fully trains the brain to be self-sufficient in getting back to homeostasis because there's always something external that you're reliant on. Yeah? Even there's lots of things out there to help you meditate by you know, creating different brain rhythms or whatever. I, don't, I think those have been shown to you know, be mildly more effective than just meditating on your own. But once again, you're reliant on that thing. You're not truly training your brain, which is what meditation you know, actually is. So ours does not re rely on any devices. What it says is, um, it's actually delivered as an online program. So it's an app. Uh, with videos and meditations and exercises, as well as weekly webinars with myself. And for those people thinking, oh, I can't meditate, it's fine because we have lots of exercises that aren't meditation for those who really detest meditation. There's lots of other great stuff. And it's delivered as weekly webinars. And then people can watch the videos, they can engage with the processes themselves. And then we also have 30 to 40 trained coaches around the world who can support people one on one with their brain retraining. And Something which has been an absolute game changer, and you know, it, we wish we'd done this years ago. We have now something called daily Gupta size, <laughs> which is apologies for the the title. But what this says is, most people with these illnesses are quite isolated. They're alone. They don't have uh, these connections, and that often contributes to their conditions as well. We have daily Zoom calls with our coaches, which takes them through the nervous system regulation 
and also the brain retraining live on Zoom. And there's about two or 300 people a day coming on these calls. And it's a wonderful community uh, state. It's uh, a place that people feel like they're being nurtured. And that has been a game changer where people feel like, hey, I come on these calls every day. I didn't even have to try and learn fully the program through the videos. I just come on these calls every day and I get my brain retrained and I feel much better. So that has been a, another way that we're delivering the program, which has proved highly effective. Because the thing with brain retraining is it requires consistency. You can't just, it's not a one-off, take a pill, you're done. It requires consistency over many weeks, sometimes months, in order to retrain uh, those systems. So that's how it's delivered is through an app and website and then um, through these regular interactions with our team. Yeah, and so for for the people listening, I think in functional med- in functional neurology, these are some of the things that ideas and concepts that we can retrain the brain. This is one of the things that we often do is if you've got a balance disorder or you we see some challenges to the frontal lobe or different areas of the brain in an assessment, we can give you exercises uh, that can retrain your brain. So the brain is moldable. It is trainable. We can make changes there. But it's just like training your muscle. If you want to build a bigger bicep, you got to work on it consistently to get a bigger, stronger muscle and then and allow for some recovery so it can heal and repair. For the brain, it's the same thing. If I've got issues with uh, different aspects of my brain, I can. There are, there are techniques that we can use to kind of retrain some of that neurology, to strengthen that neurology and help people recover. We do this with post-stroke patients, patients with dizziness and balance disorders. And sometimes those uh, people with chronic, other chronic health issues as well. But so the brain is is moldable, it's malleable, it's trainable. Um, you're training it one way or the other. That's I think we should be fair to say. You're either training it to be really good at chronic illness or you're training it to be le- or better at health for whatever that definition is, right? So if you're, whatever the input is, is going to, it's going to have an impact on the output. Is that fair to say? Yes, exactly. I totally agree with you there. And the reason that these processes have been used in physical rehabilitation is it because it's more obvious what is going on, right? So if someone's mm-hmm. got dizziness, we then train them and help them to regain their balance. Or if they've had a stroke, they can regain balance over the control of their limbs. We can physically see what's going on, right? We can see that now they can lift their hand. But the immune system and the nervous system is a bit more ethereal. Right. And says, well, how on earth you can control a system? Yeah. And yet it is a similar process. You're training the brain. You're creating new wiring that enables the brain to stop these responses and come back to normal. So, yes, these principles are proven in medicine. We're just now reapplying it to something that it's never been applied to before, which is you know, more fundamental in our system. So there's we're running short on time. I know you've got uh places to be i got places to be but i want to end with these two things so from a practitioner who's hearing this this conversation and saying hey this is a, this is maybe not the strongest point i do in my practice is help with that this brain component how can they learn the process or or become more how they can be more aware can they use the practice the practice and and can they learn the practice and use it as part of their treatment strategy uh and for the person who's the um it's an everyday person who has chronic illness how can they are there places where they can go to find somebody who's been trained in your in your treatment strategy um or where did where can they go to potentially consider this as a as a tool to help them heal and recover sure so the first thing we'll say to practitioners if they're listening is that you know, a lot of this is lots of other, you know, things out there, but we focus on the science of this. So we've actually uh, published three RCTs, two recently, one randomized control trial on fibromyalgia, which showed that just after eight weeks intervention, there was a 40% drop in fibromyalgia scores compared to the control, which was zero, halving of pain, halving of anxiety and depression, doubling of functional capacity. So there's some actual RCTs that was published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. We've just published an RCT on long COVID, which showed that Compared to a wellness program, which was diet, supplements, sleep, et cetera, our program was four times more effective at reducing fatigue and exhaustion and twice as effective at increasing levels of energy. Uh, and that was a three month program. So we have those are both published RCTs. People can see them on our website. And we're now pursuing further randomized control trials. So this is grounded in some evidence 
rather than just, you know, yeah, let's see if this works or not. And secondly, for practitioners, we get free access. So if someone is a practicing clinician, they can get free access to our complete app, our complete treatment protocol and program. Um, so that's something they can contact us about. And if they're a patient, once again, we offer a 28 day free trial. So they can come onto our program, download the app, surf around, watch videos and see if this is right for them. So there's lots of opportunities for people to engage with it. And then most people find that they're able to use the program um, and then they have support from a practitioner if they require it. But the main thing I'll say to practitioners is we take care of the whole process start to finish. So if you're working with a client and you're doing the great work that you're doing, you can literally recommend they also do this in parallel and we hold their hand for the whole process. Yep. In terms of right from the start, introducing them to the program, getting them to join the events, uh, supporting them through their recovery. It's a hand-holding process, such as the daily events. And the practitioner can simply just check in and support that client through whatever the, uh, the work that they are doing. Um, so that's how it works. And we are going to be having future educational training for practitioners on how they can integrate it into their practices, et cetera. Like, for instance, Dr. Joe Mather, he's... Um, clinical director of the Ruscio Institute. So Ruscio Institute, really big functional medicine doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they recommend, uh, you know, our program to the vast majority of, of their clients. It's gaining that traction where it's now saying, this is a great extra component that perhaps we aren't good at, but here's an organization that's got RCTs and actually handholds our client through the whole process. I mean, we, you know, 90, 95% of the time we've, uh, the practitioners get really positive feedback from their patients as well. So that's how it can work and how it can fit into clinical practice. Awesome. So we could finish up. I appreciate you coming on. I got, I could talk for another hour and a half probably on this. And so maybe we'll have to have you come back and, and talk in more depth, but where, where do people go to learn more about your, your program? Sure. So they can go to guptaprogram.com. So that's G U P T A guptaprogram.com or they can go to App Store and Play Store and download the free app. Uh, once again, just search Gupta Program. Gupta Program. Awesome. Thank you. Well, Ashok, I thank you so much for coming on the Thyroid Answers podcast. I'd be more than happy to have you come back on and kind of finish this conversation and continue to get a little bit more in depth uh, for the listener. This is a, another one of those good um, podcasts to share with friends and family. It doesn't matter if somebody's got a what their name of their diet, their disorder is. I do think, and I talk about this in the book, emotional fitness, brain-based fitness, physical fitness, all these things are pieces of the puzzle. And you need to raise your level of fitness in all of these categories if you want to have long-term long -term health and well-being. And so I think this could be a really good tool to help. So Ashok, again, thank you so much for coming on the Thyroid Answers podcast. No, it's been a delight. Thank you so much.